All right, guys, we are live. How's everybody doing today? I'm just going to do a quick mic check, make sure everything's working properly and everyone can see everything. All our technology is good. I see a lot of you in the chat already. We got people from all over the world, Canada, many states in the U.S., Australia, um, a few other countries here. Has lost his cigar. I did not lose it. The reason the stream is late is because I was trying to get my um, air purifier set up and uh, I just couldn't get it set up, unfortunately. So here we are. Anyways, so guys, today uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, we are going to be talking about body language. We are going to be talking about stress. Now, this is a topic that has been a big, a big uh, topic, a big point of contention um, between the different camps of dog trainer. Um, very, very important. I see more of you guys jumping in here. So I'm just going to basically get started with my um, spiel on this topic. The information that I have, I've, I've, co I've collated a number of videos here um, to kind of illustrate my point. But let's talk about stress and body um, stress and dog training, and let's talk about body language and dog training, and how it actually equates to reality, how it equates to the ethics and morals behind what you're doing. So, fundamentally, what people do, okay, and when I'm speaking about people, they typically tend to be people that are more in the positive only force free dog training camp. But there are other people as well that really focus on this is they focus heavily on the stress and they say if the dog is stressed if they can point to anything the dog is doing any body language the dog is expressing and say this is a symptom of the dog being stressed they use this to invalidate the training that they're looking at right they use this to invalidate the training that they're looking at because for them any type of stress basically means what is being done is unethical, immoral, abusive, whatever, you know, emotional moniker you want to attach um, to, you know, the specific behavior that you're looking at or the type of training that you're looking at. And I think we really need to evaluate this critically. So number one, a lot of the times I, I want to speak about this because I, I made a post about this on Facebook where... You know, uh, I basically call them body language Nazis. It doesn't matter what video you post. You can post a video of a dog competing on the world level. You can post a video of a happy dog healing. You can post a video of a dog doing literally any behavior. And inevitably, the body language Nazis will come on. He's panting. He's eye rolling. He's drooling. He's stiff. His ears are back. He's stressed. And basically all they're doing is they're just completely ignoring the actual video of the dog, you know, expressing whatever behavior he, he's expressing. Like, I mean, if they wanted to say, well, you know, he's a little crooked in the heel or he's crowding a bit or his stand in motion could be faster. Well, these might be something that's valid depending on what you're looking at. But instead, what they always do is instead of attacking the quality of the training, they simply attack the morals and the ethics behind the trailing, behind the training by using the body language as evidence to support their viewpoint. But let us take a journey in logic. All right. I know logic really doesn't have any place when we speak of emotional arguments. And let's face it, emotional arguments are very powerful, especially when it comes to dogs and children, because people have very strong emotional connections to their dogs and their children, as they should. But emotions should never cloud logic. And that's where we are now in today's day and age. So this idea, let's first address this topic. Let's, let's, I'm not even going to talk about the stress that they are identifying as stress. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to simply address, let's first address this logical fallacy that stress, if the dog displays any form of stress in dog training, in the training process or in the final outcome, that the training is somehow unethical or immoral. And I, uh, my, pref my 
point is that it's not. My, uh, my uh, uh, assurance to you is that it's not. Because why do we train dogs? We train dogs to fix problems, okay? We train dogs to create productive behaviors that can save the life of the dog and enhance the human-dog relationship, right? So for instance, an off-leash recall trained reliably can literally save a dog's life, stop them from running into traffic, and can also enhance their relationship that they have with their human because now the person can take the dog for walks, they can take the dog hiking, they don't have to worry that the dog won't come back. Okay, and um, not only that, you could argue it also from a humane standpoint because keeping a dog on a leash and only allowing a dog off leash in like a few, you know, fenced in areas like a dog park or a, or a ball diamond is probably not the most um, humane way to keep a dog. I, I would argue, I would postulate that uh, keeping a dog and giving that dog as much freedom as possible is, is probably the most humane thing for the dog. So... We then come down to, okay, recall, reliable recalls are good to train. Uh, dogs not pulling on the leash because they can literally pull their owners over, injure their owners, drag their owners into traffic. Uh, walking them is very unpleasant, so therefore the owner is a lot less likely to walk the dog. You know, you guys get where I'm going with this. There's a lot of things that we train dogs to do and not do, which are for the best for the dogs, for the humans, for society, um, you know, for the dog's overall lifestyle and quality of life and for the humans that share their lives with the dog's quality of life as well. Um, and again, it can be, some of this stuff can be very life-saving. Um, and then we can also talk about performance um, sport that we do with dogs, whether it's herding, whether it's bite sports, uh, whatever dog sport you want to name, right? We can talk about performance sport, okay, that we do with dogs um, and the training that we do there as well. So here's the thing, all right? The postulation is that any stress in the process of creating these behaviors or fixing behaviors um, is, is unethical, it's immoral. Why doesn't that apply to the vet? I've made this point before, but some points are worth making again. Why doesn't that apply to taking your dog to the vet? You take your dog to the vet. I don't care if the vet says they're fear-free or whatever bullshit they come up with and they spray essential oils in the air or whatever. You take your dog to the vet and you shove sharp pieces of metal into your dog. That's what an injection is. And you even, many people, choose to cut body parts, sexual organs, out of their dog, right? It's a, a, an actual surgery, right? Um, in order to... Avoid something that hasn't happened yet. In most cases, a lot of veterinary medicine is preventative. There's no guarantee that the dog is going to catch rabies. There's, an, In fact, the dog is actually very unlikely to catch um, rabies. There's no guarantee, you know, that the dog is going to catch distemper or parvo or any of these other things. It's a possibility, but it's far from a guarantee, especially in most first world countries. Yet we often do preventative things that we all recognize, right? Whether it's an injection, uh, whether it's a, a surgery to remove sexual organs that most people agree are in the best interest of the dog. Now, spaying and neutering for me, that's another topic. I'm not going to get into that today. My point is this, you are willing to take your dog and do very physically and emotionally uncomfortable things to that dog, things that cause fear, pain, stress, um, and I would, I would say in many cases, terror and, and a lot of pain in order to, you know, better your dog's quality of life, in order to ensure your dog lives a better life, lives a healthier life, is safe and is secure. Why is dog training not viewed the same way, right? And I'll, I'll tell you why, but why is it? Like, have you ever thought about it? Have you ever thought about why dog training isn't viewed the same way? I would argue that dog training is just as important as veterinary medicine, if not more important. Your dog's a lot more likely to get injured um, by a uh, uh, you know by a car than they are to catch rabies, right? Because they ran into the road. A lot more dogs get killed by cars than get killed by rabies. My cigar's out because I got too talkative. Anyways, point B, there is this fallacy out there that it's necessary to put our dogs through pain, stress, fear, 
whatever else in order to better their health and quality of life when it comes to veterinary medicine. Uh, a lot of which people, by the way, there's a lot of people that disagree with a lot of the things that vets do. Um, and they say that it's unnecessary. But on the training side of it, we don't have that same view. And I'll tell you why we don't have that same view. I'll tell you why is because of lies. Because of lies, right? I'm telling you that you are not going to make reliable, functional obedience on a dog without the use of some stress and pressure. I'm further telling you that you are not going to fix dangerous behavioral issues, right? Regardless of what anybody claims, dangerous behavioral issues without the use of some stress and pressure in the training. The whole, the, in, the training is not entirely that, but you are not going to fundamentally fix those issues and you are not going to create reliable, functional obedience in a reasonable period of time, right? With the vast majority of dogs without the use of some stress and some pressure, Right? And doing those things, we've already established that functional obedience, I'm not talking about tricks, functional obedience, okay, and behavior modification is literally, in many cases for a dog, life and death. And we've already established that it enhances the quality of life of the dog. There is no training that is force-free that is going to perform either of those functions. Functional obedience training, yes, has, yes, you don't know has. We do it all the time in Europe, blah, blah, blah. I know what you're doing in Europe and you ain't doing it, okay? So, so spare me. All these, everybody's talking, listen, guys, it's 2024. You have these. Stop telling me about it. Show it. Show it my entire channel and there's thousand other YouTube channels showing it. You guys can't show it. You guys can't show it. You cannot show yourself reliably fixing reactive behavior with a cookies or, or balls or whatever else. You can't show yourself reliably fixing a reactive dog. You can't show yourself creating reliable functional obedience that actually works in the real world, right? Not for 30 seconds on TikTok, but in the real world with any dog. I, I'm, I'm like talking like any dog. There's no one I've seen that shows it. There's no one that shows it, you know? And it's absolutely wild to me. And it's not wild to me because I know it's not there. It's hard for them to show what doesn't exist and what isn't reliable and what is very uncommon. Yes, there are a few dogs. Look, if you raise, if I had to, if I had to raise a dog and I could only train with cookies, okay, and maybe some toys, I could only do that. I couldn't do anything else. I would select a very biddable, compliant puppy that is soft and a little bit nervous, right? And I would raise and train that dog. Does that sound familiar to you? That's like every force freeze trainer's, you know, border collie, female Malinois, uh, Australian shepherd, right? A little nervous because when they're a little nervous, they don't want to explore too much. The exploratory behavior is minimal. They stay close to you because the world makes them a little bit nervous and fearful and biddable. They like working with you. So they get a lot of satisfaction out of working with you, right? And compliant. They go along with what you want them to do because, again, they're, you could, I guess you could say biddability and compliance are kind of the same thing. They're naturally oriented that way. There are many dogs that are oriented that way, right? And if you raise them from puppy and you do all the slow and careful work, you can get them fairly far with that type of training. That is not the vast majority of dogs. And I say thank God. Thank God that's not the vast majority of dogs because we don't just have dogs like that. We don't just want dogs like that. There's a lot of people that like strong, independent, courageous dogs. There's a lot of people that like dogs that, you know, aren't scared or nervous of the world. There's a lot of people, you know, that don't need a dog to be like this giant kind of suck to them all the time, right? And quite frankly, there's a lot of people that are struggling, you know, with their dogs that don't have four years to try and slowly and carefully you know, get kind of maybe sort of obedience or kind of maybe sort of fix the problem. They want the problem fixed now. They want obedience now. And that's not unreasonable. People say, oh, you're just taking the fast way. Um, yeah, the dog lives 12 years. Why wouldn't you take the fast way? We're talking about quality of life. We're talking about what is humane and what is ethical. Getting the dog to the point where they can enjoy the world in a safe um, and effective manner where they can resolve any behavioral problems they have that are impeding their ability to, you know, get the highest level quality of life, right? Why wouldn't you do that? 
Why, why wouldn't you prioritize that? That's humane. Not leaving a dog in a state of insecurity, fear, um, you know, not a, reducing the dog's freedom because you can't trust them with that freedom. You know, I always say to those people, you know, they're like, oh, I don't, I don't need fear and pain to train a dog. Okay, fair enough. Take your leash off. Take your leash off. Take that dog. You just got that dog. Take your leash off. Let him make his own decision. Does he want to be with you? Or, you know, is he going to run for the hills? I think we both know the answer. You're not, you're not going to take the leash off. Because fundamentally, you can't give your dog the choice. If you truly gave your dog the choice, his choice would be GTFO, right? Get the fuck out of here. That would be his choice, right, in many cases. Or his choice would be, oh, let me go see what's going on over there. Let me go see what's going on over here. And let me just, you know, do what I want to do. Because... That's what the dog's going to do. The dog is going to seek his advantage in every situation, regardless of whether or not he loves you, right? Barring, again, the few certain types of individual dog, the vast majority of dogs are going to make those decisions. So it is not ethical and it is not moral to train like that, all right? And here's the thing. They do not make the same results. If they did, there would be countless videos showing such. They can't point to like literally any videos i'm sure maybe there's like one or two where they can kind of make it look like it worked a certain way they can't do it they can't do it right so this is why people this is why this argument exists in the first place if we all admitted the truth they can't make this level of obedience functionally they can't fix behavioral problems without using pressure and stress to some degree in the training process if they can't admit that and then they won't admit that. We're, there's, we're, we're arguing in two different planes of reality. We're existing in two different planes of reality. Let's talk about body language, okay? Because this is important. Again, these people will always, you will show a dog fully functional obedient, fully functionally obedient, doing something their dog can't do, right? And then they'll go, well, he's panting. His tongue is out. He's drooling. His eyes are rolling. Whatever they can come up. They'll look for any micro behavior in the dog and they'll say okay because of this this is you you know you basically beat him that's why he's doing that i would never do that i'm a good person my dog can't do that because i'm a good person not because my training sucks and it doesn't actually make sense from a scientific or na nature universe slash universal law standpoint right um so but here's a couple of things you see a lot of these people right on videos where like a dog is, let's say, doing sport training, you see a lot of these people coming into the sport training world and making these types of accusations. Now, here's the thing. In a lot of sport training, you can actually force free train certain types of dogs, right? Again, depends on the discipline. Like I would say with IGP and with ring sport, um, very rare and uh, very timely and not reliable results. You're not competing on the high level because to compete on the high level, you need a dog that has a certain level of confidence, quality, uh, drive, so on and so forth. Right now, later on, they're probably gonna change it, right? But at this time, dogs that are powerful um, and strong for the most part are being rewarded on the highest level. Um, and those are not the type of dogs that are gonna be like nervous of the world and just you know do everything to please you all the time. Those are dogs that are gonna have a little bit more of a independent mindset and they're gonna have drive that's high enough that even if they are a little bit nervous, they're always gonna be looking to satisfy that drive. And in bite sport, the problem with bite sport is the drive satisfaction happens outside of the handler in many cases because there's the act of biting involved and biting is intensely satisfying to these dogs. Um, but they'll often see things where, you know, a dog is, let's see, we can find it here. Um, okay. So I want you guys to watch this, right? Because they say, okay, if we watch this, let's watch this video of this dog here. This is a border collie. Okay, he's running now. This is Border Collie, collie herding sheep, okay? Look at his behavior. Head is down. He's panting. Wait. Let's, uh, there we go. That's the spot I wanted. He's panting. Um, his head is down. Now look. 
He's moving stiffly. That's an example there. And then there's this example. This is a really good one. Mouth closed. Ears pinned a little bit. Tail down. Now this dog is stalking. He's, in, he's, he's stalking his prey. And this is the manifestation of that. He knows he must not touch the ducks, right? But he's expressing prey drive. Herding work, by the way, is, is we've selected dogs that have a lot of stock in them. They have prey drive, but the prey drive doesn't manifest itself, at least in most cases, um, in the way that the dog will actually make contact with the, with the target animal, especially the little ducks. Uh, of course, with herding dogs in the training process, you must show them that they cannot touch um, well, with the ducks anyways, that they shouldn't touch the ducks. With cattle herding and obviously, um, you know, sheep herding, the dog does make contact with the animals sometimes. Um, but again, that's in a controlled manner. That's not just, you know, stalk, uh, chase, pounce, bite, right? So you have to understand that. But this dog, based on what a lot of these people say, this dog is showing stress. This dog you know, the stiff body language, the tail down, the ears pin, mouth closed. The other dog too was panting, showing stress. Again, the tail was down, right? Now, let's take uh, this dog, okay? So this is good old Yaxi, guys. Mouth is open. He's panting slightly, but it's not so hot, so his tongue is in his mouth, right? Those body language Nazis would say that he is showing some stress. Now, I wrote, like I said, an article on Facebook where I talked about this. And I said that, look, do you know that a dog can open his eye? A dog, uh, sorry, a dog can be stiff. A dog can pant. A dog can drool. Um, a dog can do a lot of things and not be stressed. These are not universal signs of stress. But here's the thing. Even if the dog is stressed right? Like there's stress is present. That doesn't mean stress is present to the exclusion of all else. If stress was pleasant to the present to the exclusion of all else, the dog wouldn't be able to function. Here's the thing. This border collie is a little bit stressed. This border collie is a little bit stressed. This dog has some stress. There is some stress. You know where the stress comes from guys? And they don't talk about this. The stress comes from concentration. Okay, concentration. These people that complain about body language really don't understand dogs in their totality. They only understand dogs in, in myopic kind of uh, uh, ideological uh, views, right? He's happy. There's no, no other emotion that can exist there. He's fearful. There's no other emotion that can exist there. He's stressed. There's no other emotion that could exist. They don't understand that a dog, can, just like a human being, can experience a number of different emotions concurrently some emotions um, expressing themselves to a higher level and some to a lower level like for instance this dog is concentrating very hard he what you see here is stalking just like the border collie i have manipulated his prey drive for that ball okay to make him stare at me and to stalk me and chase me that is fundamentally what he's doing. Now, he's doing it in a very shaped kind of way. I've manipulated his behavior. So he stares upwards. Um, you know, he, uh, he, he, he moves parallel to me. He doesn't go too far in front, too far behind. Um, and, and he has that kind of intense fixed stare. That is a shaped behavior that I manipulated his prey drive into offering, just like the border collie herding the sheep. Obviously, it's expressing itself slightly differently. Here's where the stress comes in. Concentration can create stress. Why does concentration create stress? Any of you that have played a sport, and again, most of these body language Nazis are like, you know, obese, purple-haired maniacs that have never really played any kind of sport or done anything difficult in their lives, which is why they're so opposed to, you know, dogs doing these things either. And we can talk about the... Uh, the moral and the, the the morality and ethics of dogs engaging in sports they were bred to do, but that's first. Let's let's deal with this, right? The reality is this, okay? When you play a sport, all right. Let's let's talk about soccer, okay? Most of you guys uh, watch football or whatever else. When you play a sport and you're you let's let's pretend there's a bunch of soccer players. You're on the field. You're moving up towards the uh, opposing team's goal, and you get past the ball. 
I'm sure some of you have experienced this. You're excited. You're excited. Your adrenaline goes up. Oh my God. Especially if it's a big game, right? I got the ball. I got the ball. But then the other players are coming. Stress. I don't want to lose the ball. I don't want to let my team down. I want to score a goal or make a, a really good pass, but I don't also want to lose this ball and I don't want to, to look bad in front of my team and in front of everybody. There's stress because the possibility of failure, of not being successful creates that stress, but it's overpowered, which is why you're there and you're still playing the game, by the adrenaline and the joy you're getting from working towards that goal from the hope of maybe accomplishing that goal, of making that fantastic pass or scoring that goal. That is dog sport. That is a dog that is concentrating, whether it's herding, bite work, obedience, whatever you're seeing, right? These dogs that are concentrating, they have a very high desire to be there. It's bred into them genetically. You can't just do this with any dog. You can't take your, you know, mutt dog off the couch and get them to do what Yaxi in this video is doing, right? But at the same time, they... Of course, we don't just let them um, completely just satisfy themselves all the time. The stress comes from concentration, not wanting to make a mistake. If any of you have seen a dog tracking, that stress is also there. That concentration is also there. So let me see if I can find a good video that shows this duality. Again, a lot of people look at things very myopically, very, very myopically, right? Um, let's see if I can find this videos okay and this is a mistake because dogs are not myopic Let's see if i can find a good video ah let's see here i think this might be a good video here So this is me satisfying the dog's drive, building drive, building frustration. This is a puppy. Let's see if I can find some healing quickly. A lot of playing with her to, in this video. I'm trying to find some healing because when you sow healing with a young dog, it's good to see it because you'll see it more with a young dog. Oh my God. I think I might have just played with her the whole time in this video. All right. Let me grab another video here quickly. But I want, I want to point these moments of concentration out to you guys. Da, 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 da. See, man, where is it? Where is it? Crazy gauge. There you go. I'll just use, use gauge here. Okay. So, dog is showing arousal here, right? Now we're going to do some healing. I think this is a little ad here. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So look, dog staring fixedly upward, excited, aroused body language, panting slightly. Ah, this one was perfect. Okay. So you're going to see a down in motion. Okay. So again, same behavior. And you saw that slight lick of the lip right? Again, there, on that left turn, he licked his lip very slightly. Why? Because he's concentrating. It's easy for him to move forward. It doesn't require a lot of concentration. But now all of a sudden, I'm doing a 180 degree turn. It requires a very high level of concentration. He doesn't want to make a mistake, right? And that cause, and he, he doesn't want to make a mistake. Why? Is it because he's afraid to make a mistake? No, it's because he also wants drive satisfaction and he knows drive satisfaction only comes from doing it the right way. Is there pressure for making mistakes with me in training? Of course there is, right? Because the pressure makes the dog more correct. It makes it more easy. If I just didn't reward him when he was wrong, 
it wouldn't be enough. Even though it would cause stress, it would cause stress. Not giving a dog a reward does cause stress. Let's make no, no bones about that. A dog that really wants something that you're not giving to them, that is stressful. Just like if you think about something that you really wanted, truly wanted, okay, to understand how a dog perceives a reward, like a driven, highly driven working dog, to understand how they perceive a reward. I want you to think of something you've wanted the most in your life, right? Whether, um, whether it is, uh, I don't know, a job, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, uh, a car, a house, whatever it is, right? I remember when I bought my first house, you know, you go, you're hoping that you get approved for the mortgage. You're hoping they accept your offer. There's stress, but there's so much more hope than there is stress. Again, otherwise you wouldn't be there, right? You really, 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 really want it with all your heart. You want it so much. That's what working dogs, that's how working dogs perceive their reward, right? But there are consequences to making mistakes, whether it's for human beings in life, no matter how much you want something, you must do things right. So there is stress associated, right? With whether it's sport, whether it's something in life, like we were just talking about, stress exists for a reason. It is a biological imperative. To pretend it's not is asinine, right? It exists because it enhances our ability to perceive what is undesirable, avoid it, and obtain what is desirable, right? Avoidance and, and stress is just as important as pleasure, right? We do not operate in the human world exclusively in a state of pleasure. We are not always happy. We're not always, you know, just trying to be happy all the time. We're not happy in everything. And even if we really enjoy something, whether it's exercise, sport, Again, whatever it is, hiking, okay? Stress is involved. If there wasn't stress, if there wasn't something to overcome, you wouldn't value it as much. It's the same with the dogs. It's the same with the dogs. I don't know why we pretend otherwise, right? Now, the force free trainers would say, the force free trainers would say that if... If, okay, um, let me think about how to put this properly. So the force free trainers would say that the difference between us is that we give consent and the dog doesn't give consent. Again, I say there's a bit of a um, logical fallacy there because you have a leash around your dog's neck and I'm pretty sure he didn't give consent for that. But when it comes to dog sport, whether it's bite work, whatever it is, right? They would say, well, there's stress involved, whether it's stress from the decoy, whether it's stress from the exercises, which are often difficult. Um, you know, the dog could maybe get injured in a long attack, all sorts of things. The dog didn't give consent for this. Therefore, it's unethical and immoral. The dog was bred to consent to it. The dog is not a natural creation. This is not something that naturally occurs in nature. These dogs that we're talking about, Belgian Malwas, Working Line, German Shepherds, and some other breeds. These are dogs that have been bred for many generations to work for that piece of round rubber that I have. And not just work for it because they have to, work for it because they love it. Because it is the most enjoyable thing for them. To work, that, to, to enjoy bite work, to enjoy biting on a soup, biting on a sleeve. They truly love and enjoy these things, right? I'll give you an example. My personal dog, Gage, okay? And he's not like a superstar dog. I, he lives in the house with me. He lives in the house with the kids. Every day, I don't, take, I don't take him to work every day. I don't train him every day, okay? I sometimes leave him home. Every time I leave him home with the wife and the kids, he is not happy. He would rather come out and spend most of the day in the back of my ATV, my side-by-side. -side. I have crates in the back of my side-by-side and come out and work two times for 15 minutes, then spend the whole day at home with my family, right? He would rather do that. That is more valuable to him, right? Why? Because that's what he's bred to do. That gives him an intrinsic sense of satisfaction that cannot be duplicated by walks, that can't be duplicated by playing in the backyard with the kids, that can't be duplicated by lying on the couch. None of those things can duplicate the joy and the satisfaction he gets from doing dog sport, 
Except maybe like if I was to do police work or anything, something like that with him. Sure, I'm sure he would love that too. But you, they're basically the same thing. Not every dog, most dogs can't do police work just because the police don't need that many dogs, even if they're good dogs for the work, right? Um, so dog sport, these dogs were bred to do the dog sport. When you don't do that sport with them, when you don't do some form of dog sport with those dogs, and I'm not talking about like fucking dock diving. I'm talking about real dog sport that really gets their juices flowing, okay? Nothing wrong with dog diving, but this is not what I'm talking about, all right? Uh, in fact, we are going to have a dock diving uh, facility here shortly. Um, point B, these dogs were bred to give consent, right? That is fundamentally it. They were bred to, to give consent. So this idea that it's unethical and moral to force dogs to do things, blah, 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 we're not forcing them. If they didn't want to do it, well, you wouldn't use them in dog sport. They wouldn't be good for dog sport if you didn't do it, right? If, you didn't, um, if they weren't bred for it. So that's number two. Um, I'm going to get into some of these comments shortly, guys. Let's see here. So my point is fundamentally this. Um, the idea that stress uh, has no place in dog training is immoral, is immoral or unethical is nonsense. It's ideological drivel that doesn't stand up to the most basic logical examination. My other point is that a lot of the time, what they identify as stress, they're basically trying to say, this dog is in a complete state of stress, therefore what you're doing is unethical and immoral because he showed these tiny little, he licked his lips or whatever else. It's like, no, identifying that as stress is wrong. Not because, not because it isn't. You understand? It's, it's wrong because what you're trying to say is that the dog is stressed out when he's not. There might be a tiny element of stress at some point here and there in the expression of whatever exercise the dog is performing. But to label it as stress is, uh, it, it is fundamentally being dishonest because the average person, this is what the average person, when you say your do a dog is stressed, this is what the average person sees. Most people that didn't know anything about dogs would agree that this dog is stressed, right? That's what most people would agree. Whether you were a dog trainer or not, most people seeing this dog, seeing his behavior will be like, yeah, that dog is stressed. They're basically equating my dog licking his lips once or drooling because he's so intensely staring at the decoy to this dog. And that is dishonest and I won't allow it. And no, no trainer should allow it. This is a stressed dog. This is a fearful dog. This was a dog, this is what he was like when we first got him in a board and train. Just a pet dog, right, you know. Guys, guys. Right? And you can just see it, right? The stress in the dog's behavior and starting now to open him up with, by the way, guess what? Using pressure and play and all the full quadrant, right? All four quadrants of operating conditioning, using universal laws of nature to train the dog to function through stress. By the way, the, the, uh, the Great Dane was stressed, stressed out too, right? So you can see the stress behavior in the dog is now reducing. The dog is able to show... Um, you know, more natural behavior. You would look at that dog and say, eh, maybe he's a tiny bit stressed there, but now the stress is significantly less, right? That's the same dog. Now, again, using those methodologies they claim are abusive, using those methodologies that are immoral, somehow we made a dog that was showing the most extreme level of stress that anybody who didn't know anything about dogs would agree that dog is stressed, now that dog is able to look like that, right? He's able to look like a normal dog. They'd be like, oh, look, he panted. Oh, oh, you know, he licked his lips, right? Like right there, it's like he's stressed. It's like, no, that doesn't invalidate what you're seeing that the dog went from being a complete mess to now being able to actually function, right? So my point, my point is that if doing these things in training, if utilizing stress and pressure in training, not exclusively, but as part of an overall training system, was immoral and unethical, and using some tiny pieces of body language to substantiate that argument was true, how do we get a dog from here, okay? How do we get a dog from here? Let's see. To here. How do we get a dog from here to here? Using those things. That makes no logical sense. No reasonable person would accept that argument. Right? Now they would claim, oh, we can do it with cookies. Show it. Show it. Stop talking. Just show it. Anyways, I'm going to get to the comments now, guys. 
All right. Hmm. Let's see here. Going to the top. I'm going to roll down quickly. Somebody. So, guys, um, I see a lot of your positive comments here. I'm just going to scroll um, looking for specific questions. Um, a lot of people, uh, some people mentioning the uh, Pro Trainer certification videos. Uh, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad a lot of people are enjoying those. Seeing the trainers that are certifying and proving their ability to professionally train a dog um, in a functional and meaningful way, exactly like what I was talking about. So I'm glad you guys are enjoying those. Uh, let's see here. My dog is always mouthing me. I don't know how to make him stop. He's five to six months old, Caucasian Shepherd. Correct him. You don't like what he's doing? Correct him. His mother did the same thing. Universal, universal laws, right? Has sounds like Spock when he talks about logic. <laughs> Larry's telling me I'm late. Sorry, Larry. Zara says, hope you had a happy eat. I had a very happy eat. Thank you, Zara. I appreciate it. Uh, come on, guys. Get the likes up. He's right. Onyx, my uh, Mark, who has uh, my old dog Onyx, telling people to get those likes up. I always forget to demand people like the video. You know, a lot of other streamers just... Stop Stop the video completely until the likes come up. I made the, vi the vet, so this is from uh, Melissa. I made the vet point to someone and they are like, oh, that's not related. It's It 100% is. Exactly, Melissa. Uh, let's see what else we got. So I had an accidental breeding. My female male jumped the fence when my kids let her out and she bred with a King Corso. 11 puppies. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, went to Petco the other day for crickets, looked at dog stuff and saw they had removed e-collars. The sign said shock collars because they're inhumane. My eyes rolled so hard I strained a muscle. Yeah, you know, it's, it's again, it's a function of the word. I mean, not that Petco ever really had good e-collars. I guess you could say the sport dog collars were okay, but the usual e-collars they carried were junk anyways in terms of quality. Um, and I doubt that they sell that many because most people that use e-collars or want to use e-collars... Uh, have some interest in, in getting good quality brands, so I'm sure they uh, they weren't uh, uh, selling a lot of them. But yes, you know this is an this is the age where instead of actually doing good things to be considered a good person, you talk about good things and you f you know falsely signal your virtue um, by you know getting behind certain causes and posting memes on the internet instead of actually making meaningful changes in dogs' lives. Um, if I had known before what I know now, my Corgis would have much happier lives. I'm positive my Mal X German Shepherd is already so far ahead at five months. Yeah, most folks have told me that training should always be positive reinforcement. I'm glad to hear someone state that, in my words, negative reinforcement has a place and should be appropriately, appropriately used. That's very true, as does positive reinforcement. I talk about negative reinforcement and pressure and stress and training because for me it goes without saying that the other side of it should be there there should be positive reinforcement and i really actually don't personally know any trainers i mean i'm sure they exist that only use again this is another logical fallacy spread by the other camp in dog training is that oh if you use an e-collar if you use any kind of pressure in your training um, therefore, you must not believe in using positive reinforcement. Again, myopic ideological thinking that doesn't actually stand up to the universal laws of nature, right? Which is what I choose to operate from, not what some random, you know, scientist jury rigged, you know, in some, uh, uh, let's say, study where they already had a predetermined result in mind. I'm talking about like just any logical, reasonable human being looks at nature, looks at animals, whether it's dogs, wolves, horses, cows, whatever, and sees those animals when they interact with each other, utilizing positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment to put things into operant conditioning terms. They see those, do they see those animals um, operating and expressing self-satisfying behaviors. Um, they see those animals avoiding environmental stress and seeking uh, environmental positive reinforcement. They see that and you can then say, well, a training system should then have all of these things if you have a logical um, mind that is unclouded by unreasonable levels of emotion and uh, a lack of security maybe in yourself and who you are as an individual. 
Let's see here. Funny how my German Shepherd male got to become stressed after he was neutered. I have used the e-collar, but he got... I'm sorry, I don't, I don't understand what you said there. People don't understand that dogs... So this is from Cross Canine Training. This is David, who actually just recently passed the uh, Pro Trainer uh, Practical Certification, so good for him. Uh, people don't understand that dogs with drive genuinely enjoy beating the pressure. It's no different than humans completing puzzles. They enjoy beating the pressure more than getting the cookie. Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of dogs that are naturally that type of dog. Uh, they tend to be working dogs where the pressure actually increases their intensity. They enjoy it deep down inside. Like Bang, for instance, is that type of dog, my puppy Bang. She really, pressure for her is almost as motivating as the reward is. She's just wired that way. My dog at five months with my fumbling through the training is still better behaved than most dogs we come across when walking. That's good. Uh, competing motivators, just avoid them, right? <laughs> That's funny. So what he's referring to is this idea that there are other forms of... So again, you're thinking in terms of myopic you know, ideology. Well, positive reinforcement, the dog wants what I've got, therefore he'll always do what I want. That's stupid because if you think about it, you do not have the exclusive uh, monopoly on what the dog wants. The dog can want a bunny. The dog can want to smell, you know, where another dog urinated yesterday. The dog can want a lot of things other than what you have. And I don't care what you have, at some point the dog is going to make an alternate decision. That's called a competing motivator. And, uh, you know, you better have something more than just motivation to get you through that. What they tend to do is avoid um, and block the dog with a leash, therefore removing the dog's free ability to access that competing motivator, which doesn't sound very force-free or positive to me. but. Fundamentally, that's what they do. Uh, let's see here. I have I have trained with an e collar and saved him. Oh, that's great. Uh, okay, the little ducks are so cute. Yes, they are. The minute these positive trainers don't have food in their hands, their dog will get hit by a car crossing the street just to chase a squirrel. In many cases, that is true. How do you stop dirty outs? The dog will out fine if he isn't super jacked up, but if he is, he gets dirty and possessive. Um, well, once the dog has already established this behavior, uh, you're basically going to be using pressure, right? The dog resists giving up whatever he has in his mouth, right? So when you say out, he will let go, but usually he'll take a few little pulses on whatever it is that he's biting before he lets go. What you have to show him is that when you tell him to let go, it's not, it's not just that he has to let go, right? It's that he wants to let go. And what you're going to do is you're going to create a situation where it's in his best interest to let go. So for me, I use oppositional pressure. I'm actually working on a course specifically geared towards outs because I see a lot of people struggle with it. Um, so I'm doing a course, how I train puppies to out from day one, like basically positive training for the out and how I train older dogs that are extremely high drive dogs that have bad habits in outing, how I fix those problems. But fundamentally, I'm gonna create a situation where the dog says, when they hear that command, they go, poo, get the fuck out, right? Because he doesn't get out just because he knows he has to. He gets out because in his heart he believes, the second I hear that verbal cue, I need to clear that object completely, right? So it's a very common problem though. Mm, let's see here, what are you? How are you getting Bang comfortable with duration healing? It's not that I'm getting her comfortable with it. I don't want her to be comfortable with it. I want her to want it with all her little heart, right? People don't understand this. Again, about dog sport, it's not about creating comfort. It's about teaching the dog that this is what, or convincing the dog that this is what you want to do, right? Forcing the dog to do it or just being like, yeah, get comfortable here. That's not going to create the vibe. That's not going to create a reliable behavior that's going to last you through trials. That's going to, you know, have a dog that's showing extreme levels of concentration. You're not going to get that by the dog being comfortable. You're going to get that by the dog being desperate 
to be there, right? Desperate because he's afraid to not be there and he's afraid that if he's not there, he's going to miss something. So it's not just, oh, I'm afraid because if I leave something bad's going to happen. It's I'm afraid that I'm going to miss the good thing that's going to happen if I'm there. But that takes a fair bit of shaping to get a dog there, right? And different dogs get there differently. For some dogs, just that little ball coming to them there is enough. And for other dogs, you need to do some other things, which I go over in my secret sauce course and my power healing course. Light stress for kids and dogs builds resilience in later, in later life. For adults too. For adults too. I'm working heel right now with my pup when we cross the road. That's good. Uh, Kenny says, I disagree with that. I think you can use that if as negative punishment if the dog is really driven and already understands the fundamentals. I don't know what you're disagreeing with specifically. Negative punishment um, has certainly uh, some uses, right? Not rewarding the dog is fine, but generally I find that the benefit of it is fairly limited. People certainly overstate the benefit of negative punishment because, again, that's the world that we live in. For me, um, I, I don't see a lot of benefit in it. There is some, for sure. Um, in, in When you use negative punishment in partnership with a few of the other quadrants, it can work well. But exclusively, look, for instance, let's say I was working on a fast sit in motion. And I said to the dog, okay, we're going to walk. I'm going to ask you to sit. And he didn't sit fast. And I said, ah, 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 you don't get your treat. I guarantee you he would start sitting slower and slower and slower every single time. Every single time. Instead of saying... Instead of saying, okay, every time I ask for the sit, I'm going to make pressure that he's going to try to beat to get to the sit. And then I'm also not going to reward him if he doesn't go fast. Now I'm creating negative reinforcement and negative punishment together. Those two things. And then when he does go fast, I'm going to create the positive reinforcement. That's an example of how you use it with more than just by itself, right? Why do some IG people track their dogs on hard surfaces? Because if your dog can track on a hard surface, he can sure as hell track a field or he can track dirt, which is what you'll typically run into in IGP, right? Uh, what is the difference between WSV Worlds and WSV Universal, if there is one? There is a big one. The Universal uh, is involves a dog show. There's a dog show that's part of it, right? Um, and so typically what you'll see, and I know this isn't going to be popular to say, but what you'll see is a lot of people that maybe didn't successfully make the world team, or maybe they didn't, they're not doing so well in the worlds will then go and do a universal. It's still prestigious to win it. Um, but it's not the same level as a WSV, which is basically purely a working trial, right? Can you please explain in depth why withholding a ball when you're not getting the desired behavior is not negative? It is negative. It is for sure negative, right? But but how does the dog perceive it? Like, yes, the dog will say, yes, that's bad. I didn't get my ball. But are they going to say, I didn't get my ball because I didn't do X? In many cases, the answer is no. You'd think that they would figure that out, but in many cases, they don't figure that out and it doesn't create an improved situation. Uh, let's see here. What do you do when a dog randomly lets go of the decoy? It's not every time. I can't pinpoint why he just randomly <coughs> lets go. It doesn't seem pressure related. He never lets go with sense. On leash only. Uh, if the dog's randomly letting go, it's probably because he's anticipating the out, right? He's probably anticipating the out or he's running out of motivation to be there. Why is the dog biting, right? If you have a dog who's operating more from the reactive side, the mistake a lot of people make when they're working these dogs is they're operating as if the dog is a prey dog, right? As if the dog's motivation to be biting is exclusively prey drive. Remember how we, I said don't be myopic in how you view emotions and how you view the motivations or the pressures in dog training? They, there's several things can be present at the same time. So a dog 
for instance, like your dog, who has a fair level of reactivity, um, has a fair level of reactivity, uh, and, and that motivates a lot of his behavior in the bike work, right? Yes, he has prey, but he also has a fair bit of reactivity. He has to perceive some level of threat and animosity from the decoy in order to be continuously engaged with the decoy. And of course, these dogs have less of a gas tank than a prey dog, right? Because they're more reactive. The reactive dog doesn't thrive on long biting sequences. The reactive dog thrives on a big display channeled into some grips and making those grips extremely meaningful for the dog, making the dog believe that he is combating the decoy with those grip with the gripping behavior that you're trying to promote in the dog. So for a reactive dog, I'll trigger his reactivity, drive him into a high state of arousal, channel into prey with a body movement that switches the dog into prey, give the dog a grip. But when the dog is on the grip, this is where most decoys fail is that they treat the dog now like a prey dog. You got your grip, congratulations, big success for you. That is not success for the reactive dog, right? Or for a dog that's operating out of social aggression. That dog's drive is to either make you go away, fundamentally, even if there is prey present, they want you to go away, they want to end the threat, they want the threat to leave, or they want to hurt you, right? So you better offer the dog some level of satisfaction in that realm. So for instance, with a reactive dog, trigger the reactivity, move the dog into prey, have the dog grip the way you want the dog to grip, and then run away from the dog. Whether a quick choke off leads to running away, whether, um, you know, whether uh, they, uh, slipping the, the equipment and running away, this is the type of stuff you need to do not all the time and not always in the same way, but you need to reward that side of the dog, that motivation that the dog has. If you don't reward that motivation the dog has and you try to work that dog as if his motivation is completely prey-based, he is not going to show that same level of intensity. The other thing too is if you consistently out the dog in the same way, okay, decoy freezes up or decoy stands like this for like three seconds and then I tell the dog to out, the dog is gonna start to get ahead of it and anticipate, oh, He's doing the thing he always does before this person makes me let go. Of course, the dog's going to preempt you and start letting go. Any tips on how to avoid creating conflict with the out? Conflict only comes if you allow it, right? Conflict only comes if you allow it. There is no conflict. I say let go, you let go. If you disagree, then we are going to have a temporary conflict until you agree with me. That's fundamentally it, you know? Again, people are like, oh, I don't want to conflict with the dog. No, of course you're going to conflict with the dog. What is this idea that it's not going to come? If the dog wants to bite, making him let go is a conflict. I don't care how you couch it. I don't care what cookies you give him, what ball you give him, what trade you give him. There is still a conflict. He doesn't want to let go. You need to get him to let go. Right? And fundamentally, if you want to create a reliable behavior of the dog letting go, especially when he really doesn't want to let go, right? Especially these people, they do like the positive only bite work and stuff. And you know, everything is like trades and everything else. I guarantee you, those dogs view the bite work as a game. But the second you take those dogs out of the game and you make it serious, maybe you step on his paw, maybe he gets, you know, you, you, you flank him a little bit or something and he actually gets angry and it stops being a game for him and he starts getting a little bit intense. All of a sudden he doesn't let go anymore, right? Why? Because now he doesn't want to let go and the ball isn't enough of a, 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 a reinforcer for him to let go, right? So of course there's going to be conflict. Of course the dog is going to want to satisfy himself and satisfy his drive and satisfy his internal desire, Right? He has to learn that the only way to do that is by following your way. And in the process, there will be conflict. This idea of conflict-free training is asinine bullshit, but it sounds really good from a marketing standpoint, right? Your dog doesn't always want to come back when you call it. There's going to be some conflict, right? I don't care, again, what you give your dog. That bunny running away is a lot more valuable than whatever treat or ball you have. So... Conflict is a necessary part of the training process. It shouldn't be the entire training process. I think what people's 
mean when they say, you know, oh, I want to have more conflict-free training, so on and so forth, is simply that they don't want the dog to be fighting them all the time. And what a lot of people do is they do very ineffective or half-assed training that creates this like eternal conflict with the dog. And that's a mistake. There shouldn't be eternal conflict. There might be brief periods of conflict followed by congruence, right? Okay, we agree. We're on the same page now. We're doing the same things. We're working together. But if it's conflict all the time, yes, that's not good. Poland in the house. Good to see you. What does drive capping look like to you? I go, it's, not, it's another one of these fancy terms. Like, what do you mean, right? Like, are we talking about, oh, the dog's excited and, you know, he's full of energy and arousal and I'm channeling it into behavior that is productive, whether it's healing, motion exercises, bite work, whatever it is. Okay, well, you could say that's drive capping. I, I think that's what a lot of people mean when they say, I, I don't try to keep up with all the industry terms that, you know, come into, you know, listen, people got to sell seminars, people got to sell courses. So they got to come up with cool sounding words for shit that we've been doing since the dawn of time when it comes to training dogs, right? Um, and that's fundamentally it. So drive capping, I, I again, for me, it's just, listen, I show it in my secret sauce, make a lot of arousal, create a lot of desire, and then channel that desire into what you want the dog to do. That's fundamentally it. Um, is it hard for you when you are out somewhere and you see someone handling a dog the wrong way? No, not really. I just let people be people. You want to do what you want to do. You want to live the way you want to live. No skin off my nose. As long as you're not doing anything horrific, have at it. Um, will doing bite work in IGP teach a reactive dog to use biting to solve his problems? No, it won't. Um, you know, being clear with a reactive dog, look, Gage is a reactive dog, my personal dog that I made IGP-3 with and that I'll be competing with again this year is an extremely reactive dog. Um, and uh, it has not made him more reactive, right? Because he knows context. I let you do bite work and I let you be aroused on this field in this specific context towards that specific guy, Right? IGP, when done correctly, is a very controlled be, um, set of behaviors. So it does not create a general state of like, oh, more reactivity in the dog. If I decoyed a dog for about a year, but now I'm its handler, could dirty outs be from that? No, fundamentally dirty outs are from you not making clear what an out is, right? Out means get off, get clear. That's fundamentally it. That's fundamentally it. It's not, oh, you know, we don't have to psychoanalyze. And back, you know, a year ago, this happened or that happened or I was his enemy and now I'm his friend. And it's, it, it's unnecessary. Out means out. I don't care. Out. Let go. If you have the solution to that, it doesn't matter why the dog's not letting go. It's completely immaterial. Fundamentally, he has to understand what that command means. Just like down means down, right? Sit means sit. Heal means heal. The dog has to understand in no uncertain terms what you mean when you say those things. Guys, I hope you're enjoying this. Um, do me a favor, like the video. A like is absolutely free and it costs you absolutely nothing. It's nice for you guys to like the video. I appreciate it very much. Um... If you guys want to check out my online courses, I have a number of online courses. Uh, I am going to be doing a webinar soon. Stay tuned for that. Um, I see a lot of people are struggling with a couple of things. People are struggling with reactivity. Um, there's a lot of people that are interested in a lot of different types of training that we um, that, that we offer. And I th again, I think there's so many people that are just overcomplicating dog training. They're letting people grandstand. They're letting people posture. They're letting people make shit up. You know, and you know, use big words to try and impress you. Fundamentally, for me, man, I'm just about I'm I'm a dog trainer. 
I, I, am, I really actually suck at marketing. Uh, I've had a lot of people tell me, you know, I'm not very uh, social media savvy. I know it's crazy because a lot of people are like, oh yeah, you're the YouTube dog trainer, but I'm actually a dog trainer. I post on YouTube and in spite of my inability to, you know, I've never even looked into how to actually do the YouTube thing properly, believe it or not. Uh, like there's special times you're supposed to post. There are certain things you're supposed to put in thumbnail. A lot of the time I don't even bother with it in case you can't tell. Um, you know, but fundamentally I'm a dog trainer. I show you the good, the bad, and the ugly because I want you guys to understand the reality of dog training. I'm not interesting, interested in baffling you with bullshit. You know, and there's way too many people in the industry nowadays that are doing that. Doing the off-leash course on week four, recalls have taken a step back due to moving into the backyard. Do I need to go back to using a leash instead of intermittent recalls with the e-collar? If you're having success, keep doing what you're doing. If you're not, put the leash back on. How much stock do you put into lip licks, play bows, head bows, tail position, etc.? Is it something to really pay attention to or is it potentially misleading? Look, stress, okay. This is a whole, like this is a topic. I, you know, now thinking back to all the things I said, it's, it's so much more, like it's such a complex topic, okay? I say stress to some degree is productive and useful and, and ethical and humane to be used in the dog training process and it makes sense from a universal natural law standpoint. It can also be misused. It's something to be highly aware of when you're training the dog, right? Oh, he's a little worried right now. Now, if you've been to the rodeo, if you've been on this ride a number of times, you're not worried because you know how it's going to end. You know, yes, he's stressed right now. It's one hell of a time for him right now. But we're going to do this, this, and this, and he's going to come through it, and he's going to become very familiar with the, the expectations surrounding his behavior and surrounding what he needs to do in these situations, and he's going to stabilize, become comfortable, and open up again, right? Versus, eh, you know what? This isn't very productive. He's becoming too stressed, and he's losing the ability to think, learn, and he's actually making a lot of bad associations with what's going on right now that are going to be unproductive on the whole for my training. That's what people need to understand, Right? Just because it's good doesn't mean it's always good. And just because it's sometimes bad doesn't mean it's always bad. It's the same thing with the dog reinforcing himself, being aroused, whatever. I've seen marriages and entire families suffer for years over their one or two naughty dogs just because they don't want to occasionally put the cookies down. Yeah, very true. Very true. You kind of remind me of Larry Coria, Monster Hunter International. You know, I read those books, man. Those are cool books. I actually really enjoyed. Uh, I enjoyed uh, those books. All right, guys. I think uh, I've gone on long enough tonight. Um, thinking back, I wish I had put this. I wish I'd been a little more succinct. I wish I'd been a little more succinct in addressing this topic. I think I rambled a little bit. I kind of went too many different places with it. I should have been a little bit more succinct in how I talked about the stress and, and talked about the body language and how those two things uh, go hand in hand and how it's often miscommunicated and used to vilify, demonize versus, um, you know, really actually understanding it as a dog trainer, understanding it for what it is, when it's good, when it's not good. But hey, can't always get it right. You can't always do it. The you can't always you know um, verbalize your thoughts on something perfectly, especially when you're going live. So it is what it is. Hopefully next time I'll do better. Hey, has Isaiah here? I put a question in the pro trainer group asking about dog aggression. Any chance you could answer it real quick? Yes, I'll go in the group and I'll look at that uh, after we're done here. I will also say to you guys this. Um, sorry, let me just read this one question. I've got 11-month-old Dutchie and bought your book. Once you go from prong collar to training the dog on an e-collar, should I ever go back to the prong or just stay on a flat and e-collar? Why would you go back to the prong? Again, training is not a progression of tools. Tools allow you to do, you know, they can, they can 
assist you in getting where you want to get and sending the messages you want to send and the communication you want to make. But why would you say go back to the prong caller? Can you say, oh, you know, this specific behavior that I'm trying to train, you know, or fix, I think I could better fix it or train it utilizing this device to enhance my communication with the dog versus this device or that leash or this food or whatever it is that you're doing. That's when you, you don't say, oh, do I go back to the prong? What do you mean go back to the prong collar? What do you mean go to the e-collar? For what? How? Why? This is how you think about it. Don't think about the tool, right? This is what I rail against. I hate that shit. Uh, should, I, should I go to the e-collar in training? For what? Why? Why should you go to the e-collar? Make a logical argument, you know, that you're going to back up with some level of, of, of reason right? And, and progressive systemic logic that makes sense as to why you're going to do that, which I lay out in my book, right? Why would you go back to the prong collar? If you have a good reason to go back to the prong collar, go back to the prong collar. If you don't, don't do it. This is how you should see tools, right? Tools aren't just tools. Tools are to be used for certain specific things and to help reinforce certain specific behaviors or correct certain specific behaviors. If you don't need to do those things, you don't need that tool. Stress dogs have to understand for stress to be good. That's all. No, I, I... Listen, a lot of dogs that are stressed, they're stressed out by life. They're stressed out by nature. They're stressed out by everything, right? This is fundamentally like a fearful dog, like the dog I showed that bully... They're in this state of stress, right? They're in this state of like the world stresses them out, right? And they have no natural ability to overcome that stress and deal with the world. And you must show them how to do that, how to come through that. You have to push them off the edge, so to speak. All right, guys. I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Leave a like for me and I'll see you on the next one. Check out our uh, online courses, Patreon, everything's down below.